You are listening to the Make Change Happen podcast series from the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED. In today's episode, as we approach the 2020 World Urban Forum, IIED's urban experts David Satterthwaite and Anna Walnicki look back over how our work with urban federations started and has grown. They explain why cities must be both prioritized and seen as places of opportunity if we are to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of our podcast, Make Change Happen. And today we're going to be looking at urban issues and I'm delighted to have with me in the room um, David Satterthwaite of IIED. Uh, David, you and I have worked for many years, so I shall be looking forward to hearing your take on some of the issues we're going to talk to today. But to give our listeners a bit of background, uh, you have, um, I suppose you call yourself a development planner, but you've had a lifetime of researching and documenting and thinking about the scale and depth of urban poverty um, and what, you know, the important way of representing the reality for those vulnerable and poor communities which are often as we think misrepresented by kind of global institutions uh, i know you've looked at the current and political role of the urban poor federations and we'll be looking forward to hearing about that um, and also that you've had a, a long time now looking at climate change and the implications of the everyday hazards of climate change as well as the more crisis related situation for urban cities. You yourself, I know, are currently a visiting professor at the Development Planning Unit in the University College London. Um, and here in IID family, we're delighted to say that you've been the winner of the Volvo Environment Prize in 2004, and also part of the IPCCC team who were honoured with a Nobel Prize in 2007. Thank you. That one. <laughs> um, I also wanted to say to listeners that uh, David has spent a long time uh, working with the journal Environment and Urbanization, and this is one of the most widely read and respected journals in this um, sector. And I think one of the things that we are most proud of, and I know has been um, a particular mission for you, David, was is to really get... Um, a good number, a big number of contributors from the Global South. And that, that we feel we've achieved. And um, if you'd like to say more about that later, please do. Um, Anna, Anna Walnicki. Hi. Uh, <laughs> you are a senior researcher here in IAD. And uh, I think I, I understand you call yourself an anthropologist. Um, and do. you've been working in inclusive urbanisation. And I hope, too, that throughout this programme, sort of what we mean by inclusive urbanisation um, will come to the fore. But it's uh, my understanding is it's looking at basic service provision in the global south, looking at some of the practical and strategic ways that low-income communities can work with local government and aid agencies to find practical, manageable solutions for water and sanitation. My name's Liz Carlisle. I'm Director of Communications at IIED, and I have the pleasure of hosting us through our time together. David, I'm going to start with you. We do go back a long way. We, work, we were working together, I think, for the, the same group of people, in the 70s, uh, Jorge Hardoy, um, R.P. Misra, Omar El Agra, and Jacques Bounicourt are all names that I, I really remember. I worked with Jorge as he wrote every week to this group of people, building up this network of urban researchers across the globe. But you know this much better than I. Tell me a little bit about how that started and how, how far we've come. When Jorge Ardoy was invited to found a human settlements research program at IIED, he said on two conditions. One is that we would work with and through a very strong partnership of um, collaborators in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, and the other is that he could return to Argentina when political circumstances permitted. He left for Argentina in 1979, and we jointly managed the research program between us. And that's the, the time when I was working with you guys and just seeing 
the amount of collaboration and the amount of togetherness was really very inspiring. But what we realized is, you know, we, the universities we work with did fantastic work. We still have very strong research partnerships in the Global South with the universities. But we also observed that the changes were being driven much more by organized groups of mm -hmm. the urban poor and then by formal federations of slum dwellers and federations of shack dwellers and their partnership with local government. So when we started the research program, it was thinking that nat nat national governments and international agencies were our natural partner. Now we believe our natural partners are organizations of the poor and the local governments they work with. And so presumably that was the sort of direct experience of Jorge returning to Argentina and his wife Anna's work in the local communities in Buenos Aires. In 1986, Anna Ardoy began to give advice to informal settlement dwellers. And this then developed into a, a whole program of work where our sister institution in, in Buenos Aires developed these programs of support. We noticed their importance. Um, we've tended to think in the 70s that we had to change national governments and we had to change international agencies. These were the change agents we should work with. Through Anna's work and then through our work with, what, 30, 31, 32 federations of slums and shack dwellers, we now focus much more on grassroots organization and their partnerships with local government and their capacity to make change happen. So, Anna, what do we, what do we mean by informal settlements? I'm just thinking it would be good to share with listeners. We're so used to using that and we know exactly what it is, but what, what does it mean for someone who's not so familiar? Okay, well, there's, I mean, there are a couple of terms, I guess, that get used. The term slum, according to the United Nations, 45% of urban households in developing countries live in slums, and they're essentially settlements that lack improved water, sanitation, housing. If we take a slightly broader term, um, informal settlement, I guess we're starting to think a bit more about the nature of tenure um, and the legality of the settlement that we're in. But I guess more generally, if you think about the lived experience and who's living there, these are the poorest people in the city who can't afford formal housing, livelihoods or the basic services that provided formerly in the city. These are communities that are, that are at the forefront of environmental injustices. They might not have access to appropriate sanitation or they might be downstream from industrial polluters that are in the city. Increasingly, um, I think as David touched on, they're vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So poor housing, um, lack of drainage means that a heavy rainstorm can wash away your housing, your possessions and even your, um, your, your means to a livelihood. OK, so we know that um, these c communities in cities have all kinds of constraints and the things that you have just described. But we also know that they are really good at self-organization and can work together and develop their own motivation, their own relationships with other stakeholders. And I think, David, you were beginning to talk about that. We've worked with federations of slum or shack dwellers in 32 nations. That's a very considerable uh, movement of people. Can you tell us a little bit about the innovation or the, or the things that you have learnt and documented from that experience? Well, the Federation started in India, where there was um, the women slum dwellers and the women pavement dwellers formed informal savings groups and then began to visit each other, learn from each other, support each other. So what was lots of individual savings groups then became a federation. And this remarkable man, Jokin, who was head of the National Slum Dwellers Federation, realized the power of these women's savings groups and supported them. So you had this alliance between Mihila Milan, the women's savings groups, and the National Slum Dwellers Federation. We got to hear about this in 1990 when Sheila Patel, who had supported this whole process, um, happened to be in England. And learning about the process um, learning about the methodologies they use, this capacity to do surveys and enumerations, um, the capacity to broker agreements with local government. That then intrigued the, the housing activists in South Africa when they were thinking what should they do with the apartheid government 
f um, being replaced by a representative government. Members of Mahila Milan and the Indian Slum Dwellers Federation were at some key meetings in South Africa. And what they said is that don't wait for government to support you. You have to be organized. Even if a government supports you in theory, you have to be organized to negotiate the best deals. And so, cutting a very long story short, the South African Federation was set up. Then slowly, well actually no, very quickly, the ideas permeated. So you had women's savings groups forming federations, Zimbabwe, um, Namibia, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya very successfully, um, Sierra Leone, Philippines. I'm probably missing several. But I think, well, a point you're making, which is wonderful, is there's a kind of cross-country exchange of ideas. It was a sharing of experience. Yes, and a solidarity. And presumably the solidarity was a very important part of that. Hugely important. You hear constantly Federation members saying that the Federation members are my sisters. So a real sense of this self-motivation, a group growing together over the world being a force for their own change. Absolutely. But also to, to remind us that, you know, they can do amazing things. Um, they've done profiles of thousands of informal settlements, hundreds of cities. They've built homes. They've done upgrading um, at scale. Uh, they can um, put in storm drains, sewers, and water supply in their own settlement, but they can't produce the mains to which these have to connect. So it's... When they organized to do things themselves, it was also being organized to show local governments what they're capable of. Now there's hundreds of cities where partnerships are formed between the federations um, and the local governments. And these, to me, are much the most exciting um, examples of real change. And these are things that can be taken to scale because yes. they're sort of vibrant collaborations between yes. key stakeholders. There's two key international players in this. One is SDI, Slum Shack Dwellers International, which is the small umbrella group that supports all the federations and all the federations are affiliates of it. And they, for instance, manage the, the constant interchanges between countries um, and funding coming in to support the federations. The other is the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, which has been supporting grassroots organizations and savings groups for decades and uh, has an ambitious program to support them to work at city scale. The, 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 the method is quite simple. They will fund six, seven or eight um, small local projects driven entirely by the inhabitants of the informal settlement. And those seven or eight then go to local government and negotiate with them and try to come up with a citywide solution, not the typical local government who handpicks one solution here and there and ignores the other 120. And, uh, and I think beyond, beyond the really impressive work that's happening at the settlement and the city level, there have been really interesting attempts to, to talk to global narratives that really shape the way that we understand urban poverty in, in the global north and, and beyond the settlements and cities that these federations work in. And a really interesting example of this is the work that um, the Asian Coalition on Housing Rights has done on poverty lines. So it's quite clear that international poverty lines don't take into consideration the real cost of living in cities. But just to stop you for a minute, what do we mean by a poverty line? So the World Bank states that uh, the, the, the poverty line sits at $1.90 currently, and that, that's the same for everyone. Um, and so the Federation, some of the groups that are affiliated with the Asian Coalition on Housing Rights wanted to interrogate this assumption. And essentially they collectively decided that they needed to, to be clear on um, what it really means to be poor in the city. So do you have access to water? Do you have access to food? Can you send your child to school? And they did a series of workshops and focus groups with communities all over Asia, in cities all over Asia, and they came up with a multi-dimensional series of, of indicators that would vary from context to context, but was really, really important in demonstrating that this, this poverty line of $1.90 a day means nothing mm -hmm. in, in a given city, and instead you really need to break down what is the cost of, 
of accessing all these basic services and the means, means that you need to get by on a day-to-day basis. So it builds a completely different picture. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that, that sophisticated thinking through what the context is, what the reality is, is where people can get to real change. Absolutely. So I think it's, it's great, actually, to hear how far we've come you know, over the years that you've been talking about, David, and the amount of um, documenting of different examples, uh, particularly in environment and urbanisation, as we've talked about earlier, a wealth of information, um, a terrific progress. But, of course, we still have a very long way to go. Um, and with all this talk of the kind of new urban agenda and the ambitious goals that we have in the SDGs and the Paris Agreement, it, what, what, what's the chance of this? Wh- how, where do we go from here? Well, we have decades of commitments made within the United Nations that are not fulfilled. We should remember in 1976, the United Nations Conference on Human Settlements made a commitment that everyone would get water and sanitation by 1990, or as soon after that as possible. The Sustainable Development Goals are impressive in that I don't think anyone can disagree with the goals. Um, It's also nice not to have them going over 300 pages. (laughs) They're short and they're (laughs) concise. But these are national governments making commitments within the United Nations, and they will not be held to account. Mm. They ignore the fact mostly that it's actually city governments, local governments that are, are needed to drive the change. And they almost always ignore the federations. The new urban agenda doesn't mention mayors once in its 66 pages. And they are critical. Absolutely critical. They're also a very critical part of the the success stories of the last 10 to 15 years in particular cities. And, you know, making statements about what you want to do, but not saying by whom, Mm. with what, and who's going to cover the cost. Almost no acknowledgement of the importance of the federations. Um, we've still got a far too top-down, national government-dominated system, and it's been very difficult to change that. I wanted city governments to make their commitments to the sustainable development goals. I mean, it's national governments that make those commitments, but most of the responsibility for them lies with local governments. Mm. In the same way that local governments have committed to the Paris Agreement, even if their national government doesn't support it, It would have been great if city governments had committed to the SDGs and then to set up the monitoring to show their progress in this. And again, that's because where the change is really happening. Yes. It's at that level. So we're we're a few days away now, I think, from the World Urban Forum. It's going to be in February. And again, another huge, big sort of global meeting, um, a conference. You know, is this the place where change can happen? I think we believe not, but it is the place where the forum can look at and discuss together a sort of an exchange of views and experiences on sustainable urbanization. And I know that they want to look at the kind, they want to have that perspective of cities of opportunity, you know, connecting culture and innovation. And a lot of what you've been both talking about this morning is exactly that. It's where culture and innovation and a local energy comes together for change. So this is an opportunity for us to talk about this. I know we're doing um, a project with UN Habitat, and it's UN Habitat who hosts the World Urban Forum. I know we've been looking at uh, or working with them on a project, a pro-poor planning of climate resilience in marginalised neighbourhoods. So I know there's a willingness um, and... Uh, a hopefulness to really bring marginalised communities into the centre of debate. But what are some of the uh, the innovations that we would like to tell that audience? The international funding agencies could achieve so much more if they developed the means to support the local. At the moment, all the decisions are taken at national level and at international level. And I watch the federations and see how well they use money. What we ought to have is a fund for grassroots initiatives and partnerships with local government in every city in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And the funding needs are pretty modest. Uh, I always dream that 
we just need 1% of global development assistance going to local funds that are accountable to and supportive of grassroots organizations and federations. That would be about a billion dollars. Hmm. And that's an amazing thought, isn't it? I mean, we think about that all the time in our ideas, getting money to where it matters. Absolutely. And I think people tend to think of these things as huge concepts. But I think the point you're making, which is a really important one, is it doesn't need loads of money. It just needs money in the right places to be used by the right people. With the right accountabilities. Yeah. Accountabilities down to the people yeah. that, that these are meant to support. And that those kinds of channels or pipes or journeys of money are very difficult to manage but that's the big thing that we want changed yeah. Anna can you tell us a little bit about um, some examples of that perhaps in terms of sort of local participatory and inclusive planning I mean those are also um, ways in which we have to work differently. So yeah, just picking up on what on what David said about about getting money to where it matters and and the sorts of processes that that that, that finance could support. There's some really really innovative work happening um, in a settlement in Nairobi right now, Makuru, where they've been able to negotiate access to land. There are around 300,000 people living there. Um, and communities are part of a holistic, settlement-wise upgrading process. They're working in partnership with local governments to de develop a collective approach that will not only improve access to basic services and housing, but it's, almost, it's also um, promoting climate resilience and starting to think about mitigation. So it's very, very innovative. The aim overall is to deliver climate resilient, inclusive, low carbon development, as well as access to housing, basic services and livelihoods. And what does that mean? What does that look like in practice? It means thinking through the efficiency of solid waste management. It means um, separating out food waste, organics and recycling for the benefit and for the be with benefits for livelihoods. It means thinking through cooler housing designs. It means providing green space, designing green space into settlements. It means careful consideration of high density um, neighbourhoods and how that plays out in a city. It's mixed use development, so there's housing and opportunities for livelihoods, um, pedestrianisation, consideration of cycling, solar power for street lighting and use of um, LPG, liquefied petroleum gas for stoves and cooking. So you can see that every aspect of people's lives and livelihoods are being thought through, but also with an attempt to kind of adapt and mitigate climate change. I think what amazes me is, I think you said at the beginning, you're talking about a community of 300,000 people. Absolutely. That, that, that is a big community. And what you're talking about, I think, is bringing all those voices together in a kind of collaborative engagement that addresses all these issues, but together. Well, it's the genius of the Kenyan Homeless People's Federation. Uh, they've got long experience in doing this in smaller settlements, um, but this is certainly a, uh, a, a pretty dramatic increase in scale. And, and are they going to be successful? Well, they've got the support of, um, of, of the local government. And yes, I think, I, I, I think they will be successful. Mm -hmm. There'll always be niggles and difficulties and small conflicts. But they've managed to generate an amazing consensus in this whole process. And it's a terrific example to be able to share with others for a future. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that um, I think, you know, the World Urban Forum wants to see is an acknowledgement that cities are a place of opportunity. And what you've just described seems to be a massive opportunity. Well, it's making cities um, create the opportunities. Prior to the upgrading, it was, it was just struggling to stay alive. And it's really, it's nice to hear a positive example about the potential of cities. You know, we tend to think of them as chaotic, as overfilled with people. We see them as challenges. It's nice to see that these can be places where great collaborations are born and changes can be made together. Exactly the point that Sumsuk Buniobancha, the head of the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, has been making for 30 years. Well, we must keep making it. So the other thing that we like to think about is where should change happen? We think this importance of looking at local action 
for kind of global change and sharing that. But where, where are the places that you think now, I'm going to kind of close us with a thought from both of you on you know, what is the next big change you want to see? Anna. I guess it's just interesting to note that um, a lot of the innovation that happened in Latin American cities then drove the democratic national processes that unfolded during the 2000s. And given the changing nature of, of democracy and the new leaders that are coming in in certain parts of Latin America, we really hope that those cities can continue to hold some of those democratic processes um, and, and shape some of the national processes. I think it would be really great to think about how um, the climate finance that's that's coming online can be made available to grassroots organisations in cities. Um, it's clear that um, communities in informal settlements are on the front line of climate change and they're also starting to respond and adapt and even mitigate some of the impacts of climate change. So trying to think carefully, making the most of the fact that the COP meeting will be in Glasgow this year, what can organisations like IID do to connect some of these grassroots organisations to some of these bigger debates around climate finance, adaptation and mitigation, I think. And how optimistic do you feel about that? I mean, we're, we're in February, so I'm feeling <laughs> optimistic. We've got time. That's good. We We've have got, got time. We've got time to nail this. But you um, think there's maybe a groundswell rising behind this idea? Well, I think it's interesting given that you have social movements like Extinction Rebellion, mm -hmm. they kind of, they're British, they've carved out a space for social movements to talk about climate change. Maybe it's time to bring mm -hmm. social movements from the global south to the table. Um, and I think there's scope for organisations like IID to, visit, to facilitate that in yeah. the next few months. And such good examples that we've talked about today that Absolutely. we can share. Absolutely. David, closing remarks from you. The floor is open. The two groups that I believe will generate most change are city governments and grassroots organizations and federations. We've had some fabulous mayors in the last 15 to 20 years um, in Europe, in North America, but also very much in Latin America. And these come in response to the return to democracy, um, real decentralization. And a whole new generation of, of professionals came to see that they, they wanted to be mayor and they wanted to drive change, but within very strong democratic accountabilities. You also see the spread of participatory budgeting um, around the world, but mostly in Latin America, which is a commitment by a city government, not only to allow um, each neighborhood to define their priorities, but to hold government to account for all its expenditures. The other, of course, is the grassroots organizations and federations and the network of NGOs that support them. This is community-driven, but as mentioned earlier, it depends critically on local government, seeing them as a positive force, learning their capabilities, and then forming partnerships, partnerships where there's even joint control of local funding. So, again, this the importance, I suppose, of democracy, of, of local government of people working together is critical. Yes. And, and do you have a sense that there's, there is enough of that good environment in which these kind of initiatives can proliferate? Are you feeling positive about that? Well, you read all the, the stories where, of success and of ingenuity and you, you become optimistic. And then you realize that these are outliers that these aren't necessarily um, generating change elsewhere, and you get pessimistic. And then you go to a meeting of the Federation, and again, you get mm. optimistic, mm. because the, the drive, the innovation, the insights they bring to development are what really should be making change happen. That's really good to hear. And I think it does fill us with hope, because certainly at IID, we've spent a long time sharing these examples. Thank you very much, both. Um, this has been a really great conversation. It's only a short conversation, and we hope a good introduction to our listeners. Um, May the meeting in February really demonstrate cities as an opportunity, uh, a place of innovation and change. Uh, that would be something we would feel very happy to see emerge from that debate. You can find out more about Anna and David's work and the work of the wider Human Settlements team at www.iied.org urban. 
We greatly value our listeners' opinions, so please leave us your feedback and comments on our website podcast page. You can download our urban-themed publications for free at www.iied.org slash publications. You have been listening to the Make Change Happen podcast from the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED. The podcast is produced by our in-house communications team. For more information about IIED and our work, please visit our website at www.iied.org.